Okay, well, thank you all uh, for coming this evening. We're so glad to have you all um, take some time out of your evening to um, visit with us. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so you guys can kind of see what we've got coming here to you. Um, so, um, welcome again um, to the Monroe Myers Family Care Enhancement Project Information Series. Um, this kind of was born out of the information series we had had that were transition specific, but we wanted to broaden it uh, to a greater topics to more families and um, for more people that we could get um, really important and pertinent information out quickly. Uh, tonight, we're going to go ahead and be discussing open enrollment in Medicaid Managed Care Organizations, or MCOs. Um, my name is Rhonda Heights, and my coworker, Jennifer Hansen, um, we're going to be kind of the moderators this evening. Uh, I will be walking through this initial uh, intro, and then Jennifer will be um, taking care of the questions in the chat. So the Family Care Enhancement Project is part of um, the Monroe Meyer Institute. We also are called the FCEP. And part of that is parent resource coordinators that are throughout the state of Nebraska. Um, these are parents of children with disabilities who help other families navigate medical systems, um, if they're having educational issues, um, walking through community resources, basically just trying to help them get the information they need. And many times that's something that they've actually experienced themselves. Um, we help those clinics that we work in um, meet the social determinants of health, which are any of those non-medical needs that affect health outcomes. So um, you know, transportation would be one of those things where it's hard to access medical services if you don't have transportation, but it's not a direct medical service. So those are the things that we try to help families with. Throughout the state of Oma, or the state of Nebraska, excuse me, we have um, 12 staff and we're growing. Um, so as you can see, we have um, PRCs and staff here in Omaha, Kearney, Lincoln, and Norfolk. So, um, and we also have two bilingual PRCs. So um, we, we're really trying to get the word out that there's things um, about information for families um, in lots of different ways. And this is one of those with these um, webinars. So a few housekeeping items. Um, we are recording these sessions. Um, if you were with us for any of the previous sessions, we have now a web page. Um, that has a video library of all of those. And now we have a new video library for the more broad topics that aren't transition specific. So I have the link here as well. Um, please mute your computer. Um, I may have turned that on as well. Uh, all questions should go through the Zoom chat to Jennifer. Um, that way we can, we, we have a number of people and it's really difficult in a webinar online type setting. Um, if we have people talking over each other, asking questions vocally um, to, to kind of make sure we're getting everyone heard. And at the end of the session, there is a quick poll, which really helps us determine whether or not we're hitting the mark with these sessions, if the information that you're getting is helpful, um, because we want to make sure that we're getting information and, and, and all of that out to families that's really pertinent to them. Um, next session, just to kind of put on your radar, we will have Tony Green coming to talk about home and community-based services, um, which would be like all of those waiver programs and kind of going an overview of all of the differences and um, what those are between the different programs because this can be kind of confusing. So um, he's going to be with us October 27th. So put that on your calendar. Um, here's the contact information for both Jennifer and myself. Um, I didn't put our phone numbers up here. I can get that to you if you would like it. Currently, we are both working from home. <laughs> so email is probably the easiest way to reach us and then we can schedule something if you would like. But that, that's our contact information there as well. So tonight, very excited. Open enrollment is coming up for um, Nebraska Medicaid. And if you're not familiar with that, if you have Medicaid, um, there's kind of an overarching company um, or, or management system um, with Heritage Health and that there are then subcontracts to three different um, managed care organizations. 
So we have representatives from each of those organizations here to kind of tell you a little bit about their program and what maybe some of the differences might be between them and, and um, so that you can make an informed choice um, during this next upcoming open enrollment um, period. Uh, we have Kim Manning from United Healthcare, Joni Thomas from Nebraska Total Care, and Jennifer Wiesner from Healthy Blue. Um, I do want to make just a quick note. Tonight's um, discussion will be broad, so we won't be able to discuss specific cases. Um, but if you do have something um, that you would like, you know, a follow up for, please, you know, contact either myself or Jennifer, or we will have contact information just because we, um, so that we can go more in depth for like a specific situation. And with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to our lovely presenters for this evening. If I can stop my share. There we go. So I think first up, Kim Manning. Kim, I'm gonna go ahead. Okay, and it looks like you're unmuted, so we should be good to go. Good evening, everyone. Hi, my name is Kim Manning. I'm the director for um, marketing and community outreach for United Healthcare Community Plan of Nebraska. And with me this evening is my colleague, Barbara Palmer, who is the director for health services and quality, and Patricia Cartledge, who is the associate director for health services for the health plan. So to get us started this evening, a little background on United Healthcare. We have an opportunity um, for the citizens of Nebraska to make a positive difference in the lives of individuals and their families so that we can really help them with all of their healthcare needs. We do this through um, a foundation of five values, um, integrity, so honoring our commitment um, which is fundamental to never compromising on our ethics, compassion, truly walking in the shoes of the people we serve and those with whom we work with, relationships, building on trust through collaboration, um, innovation, always looking for improvements in which we can provide care, and then performance, demonstrate our excellence in everything that we do every day. A little bit around the organizational structure for United Healthcare. It is um, broken into two key areas. Um, one is with United Healthcare, which provides the healthcare services and the benefits that we are contracted with the state. And then Optum is our informational and technology arm of our organization that enables us to do those technology pieces that support healthcare. So for United Healthcare, um, these are the states in which we are currently offering our Medicaid services. We serve nearly 60 million people across the United States and in with the various categories of age. So those who are families, um, shipping um, children, um, our Medicaid expansion program, which started in October, long-term services, the duly eligible are our key um, programs that we offer in Nebraska. So for United Healthcare, we have a very strong history in Nebraska. We actually started our operations back in 1984. Um, we began serving Medicaid clients in 1996 with three counties. In 2010, we were awarded the three-year contracts that so we've moved from three counties to 10. On January 1 of 2017 was a contract for Heritage Health, which went statewide. And then on October 1st of this year, we implemented with the state Heritage Health Adult Expansion. So fairly new with that program. Sorry, home phone ringing. <laughs> 
Um, one key thing to call out is our commitment to our community. So we are involved with several organizations to provide services such as, pardon me, My husband got it. Um, we work with the Special Olympics on their healthy athlete screening. Um, we offer a soccer clinic. We've worked with Creighton University and UNO to provide a soccer clinic um, for youth. We're very involved with our community gardens with Together Inc., Diaper Drives, um, Project Homeless Connect, Clothing Drives, Back to School events, um, programs with foster care, and then grants that we have given to organizations for food pantry and blankets. Another distinction with United Healthcare is our connection with those who are very vulnerable with um, being near homeless or in homeless situations. So we work with our Medicaid members on any sort of housing issue that they may have and try to arrange supportive safe housing for them and then look for solving other social determinants of health. Just as Rhonda spoke earlier, the social determinants of health are truly barriers to care. So we'll work with the member in terms of food insecurities. It could be transportation um, and, um, and housing as another initiative. I will turn it over to my colleague, Barb, who will talk about our care management model. And Jennifer, you may have to unmute Barb. That was Barb Palmer, correct? Correct. Okay, she's been unmuted. Thank you so much. Good, after, good evening, everyone. This is Barb Palmer, and thank you, uh, Kim Manning, for sharing the information in regards to United Healthcare. At this time, I'd like to go a little bit deeper and share with you about our care management program. And core to any care management program is the member. And the member is the center of our care management program. The member, um, when individuals come on to United Healthcare, we assign a clinical coordinator or um, a care coordinator navigator um, who is able to work with the member at any time during any situation to help the member um, with the needs that they may have been identified. We do health risk screeners. We do um, plans of care. Um, we work with the member and whoever the member wishes to have in their care team. So that could be the member's PCP. It could be their behavioral health therapist. Um, it could be community uh, resources such as a peer support specialist. And what we do is we partner with the member, we meet the member where the member is at, and we start on a journey with that member to walk side by side with that member to help them with their needs as they navigate the healthcare system. As you can see here by this uh, um, diagram here that the member is at the center who needs the care, but then we branch out. We're gonna work with the behavioral health advocates, peer support specialists, um, registered nurses, registered nurses that might have a, a expertise in transplant or maternity care. Um, also, we have pharmacists that are part of our care team and also the um, home and community-based uh, service providers. There's PT and OT. It just fans out depending on what the individual needs. We also work with our partners in the community and at the state system, county health departments, transitions for support, member service advocates, division of behavioral health, child and family services. Our clinical coordinators are trained to meet the needs of the member and help them navigate that system. So who are our clinical coordinators? Our clinical coordinators are registered nurses, they're licensed independent mental health practitioners and master social workers. And the team is spread out across um, the state of Nebraska and they live and they work in the communities of the members that we serve. So they have the insight and the knowledge of the resources that are available in those towns. Whether you're going to Cherry County, Nebraska, or you're here in Omaha, 
or maybe you might even be up in, uh, by um, McCook. Um, the clinical team is out there. We do field visits when um, prior to um, our COVID outbreak, um, and but as uh, members need um, face-to-face -face visits, um, we will work those in uh, depending on uh, their particular need. We our clinical coordinators um, will work with the member on their medications and bring the pharmacist in. Um, again, we offer an array of services and support for the member. So if you're asking yourself, wow, I want a clinical coordinator, or I would like to have someone work with me on my plan of care. If you turn your member card, ID card around and you'll see the, call, the number for member services. If you call that number and you ask to be connected to a clinical coordinator or your clinical coordinator. Our, um, our member services team will do a warm transfer if possible, but they will be, if not, then they will have the clinical coordinator reach out to you um, and to set up um, a time to meet with you and to discuss what you might need and how we can help you. United Healthcare, um, we are have a uh, array of services that we provide and um, whether you're inpatient or outpatient or whether you just need some help um, getting a new um, member ID card or a member handbook, your clinical coordinator is there to help and serve you. It is centered around the person. The person is the whole person. We focus on the um, physical health, behavioral health, and the social needs of the person. Um, again, we align uh, with the delivery systems that are in the communities and help you navigate those systems. Kim, I'm going to turn it back to you to share the rest of United's story. Thank you, Barbara. So a little bit about our 2021 value added services. So when we enter into a contract um, with the state, um, it is for the MCO to provide the benefit services outlined in the contract. What additionally occurs is each of the managed care organizations um, add on top of that value added services that we feel that would be strong supports for our members for whatever needs that they may have. So a little bit about moms and kids getting more rewards. So for the family population that we serve, uh, one of the, our new value adds is a debit card to encourage first time and reoccurring mothers to receive a $200 debit card for completing their first prenatal visit in the first trimester. Now early prenatal care is very important for a healthy baby. Um, so this is our way of encouraging um, our members to start early with their prenatal care. Healthy First Step is our um, program in which month over month, we educate moms on the importance of healthy pregnancies and then also the first 15 months of a child's life. We offer community baby showers um, out in the community. We partner with local organizations to offer education. And then those members who do attend the community baby shower, they have a option of choosing between um, a couple of items that would be helpful when they have their child. Um, we offer breast pumps to our mothers, um, back to school programming to promote healthy habits and nutrition. We cover sports physicals. We have a national relationship with Sesame Street, so we have educational materials to help families understand food guidelines and healthy habits. Kids Health is our online resource with video, video, video sorry, and articles to encourage healthy behaviors for teens, kids, and parents. Dr. Healthy Hound is our um, mascot, and then we offer text for baby to provide health information on We also, for members, we offer what we call wandering and elopement. So for those individuals with disabilities who have a tendency to um, wander out of the home, we provide families with door and window alarms up to six per household as an aid for those um, families. We have a program called On My Way. So as a um, youth is um, making decisions to transition out of their home um, to independent living or to support our foster care um, children. It's a program app tool that um, builds skills on money, housing, 
um, job training and education. Uh, we offer free cell phones to our members through a national program called Lifeline. Um, Health for me is our mobile app. So at your fingertips using your cell phone, you can pull up finding a doctor, medications, and even pull up your ID card when you're visiting your doctor. Healthify is our tool to find resources such as food pantries, housing support, childcare, diabetic education, and more. We also offer education to support members with their um, completion of GED. We offer four vouchers for the completion of that. Um, there's extra transportation for WIC appointments, prenatal um, parenting classes, AA and NA meetings. Um, members can earn um, card rewards for healthy behaviors, visits, and their completing their immunizations. We do waive all co-pays for members. NurseLine is our um, support tool that a member can call um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they help um, a member in terms of understanding symptoms, if they can do self-care or if the member should go to their PCP hospital or urgent care. For convenience, we offer 90-day supply of prescriptions on select medications so the member doesn't have to make frequent trips to the pharmacy. And then I've spoken before about housing supports for our members. Um, this slide is um, context for each of us. Again, Barbara Palmer and Patricia Cartledge are our team professionals for health services. Um, Gloria Kennedy is actually um, a member of the um, Community Advisory Committee for Monroe Meyer. She couldn't be with us tonight because it's her birthday. Um, and then myself. So um, we would take any questions following the pre presentation or any questions that would be forward to us. Thank you very much this evening that we could share our information. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Um, Jennifer, did we get any questions? We, we just got one in the chat box um, and just wanna encourage anybody else who has questions, go ahead and, and chat and they'll come directly to me. Um, and I'll forward them. Um, the question was, what would make a family member qualify for the free cell phone? Um, if you don't have a cell phone, all you have to do is call our member services and we'll provide you the information to obtain one. Okay, I don't see any other questions right now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and if you do, um, you know, please feel free to go ahead and continue to put those questions in for Kim and her team or our other presenters um, that will be coming up here shortly um, so that we can do our best to, to get those answers for you. Um, let's see. I'm wondering, Kim, it looks like you're still sharing your screen. There we go, awesome. I think next we'll have Joni Thomas from Nebraska Total Care visit with us. And let me make sure that I can, we've got Joni so she can talk to us. There we go. There we go. Okay, and let me share my screen as well figure out which one I want. Is that up there? There we go. Okay, so, well, as Rhonda said, my name is Joni Thomas and I'm with Nebraska Total Care. I have been with Nebraska Total Care since right after Go Live in 2017. And I am their community and disability liaison. And we'll get more into that in a little bit. So um, Nebraska Total Care is a subsidiary of a larger corporation, which is the Centene Corporation. And we believe strongly that everyone deserves access to high quality, affordable health care and that healthcare is delivered best locally. 
So we do have local partnerships and community involvement that help all, all of our members live healthier lives. We do look at socioeconomic conditions and believe that they can definitely influence the health risks and outcomes that individuals experience. And we believe in whole health solutions. So we know that it's not just you know, one piece of a person may be a medical condition, but that we really try to work towards all solutions that are necessary to achieve a, a sustainable health. And we have also have a lot of diversity and inclusion in our company, which allows us to see the challenges that our members of all types and experiences. And it does offer an innovation to those solutions so that we can meet those challenges that we run into. We have approximately 170 employees throughout the state. Um, additional employees that were just recently hired for the expansion. And we do have offices in Omaha and Lincoln, and then we have a remote employees as well in the, the greater Nebraska. Um, we do have a statewide outreach. And we do also, similar to what Kim was talking about, we do a smart start for baby and we do diaper drives. We had a member who was really used knitting to uh, calm themselves with some of their uh, mental health issues sometimes. And so she ran out of yarn during the pandemic. Go figure, you couldn't find yarn anywhere. And so we have a lot of creative people on staff and we started creating just a, a knitting closet. So if we, you know, just trying to meet those individual needs and come up with creative solutions. So now we have that available for other people as well. Um, we, and we do, we have a, the member and provider service call center. We do have a, different divisions of like provider relations, care management, community health services, disease management, and quality improvement, of course. So our care management and team, uh, very similar, I'm sure, to the other MCOs. We do have nurses and pharmacists and uh, chief medical officers, and um, we do have community health workers, and those are the individuals that go out to members' homes and help them maybe fill out applications to different programs that they might need or help them pay their bills or just um, talk with them about what their needs are and how they can, along with our care management team, uh, accomplish the goals and a healthier lifestyle. We do have psychiatrists and licensed mental health practitioners, alcohol and drug counselors, and social workers. So we do have that clinical piece, and then we have the, the social work piece um, as well. We too try to wrap all of our different compartments, departments um, around our individual members and often have care conferences with a, an individual member when there's something that is very difficult solution to come up with and we can bring everybody together. And we have that externally as well as internally uh, with that member and trying to find solutions to all of their health needs. So on our brief, on our website, Nebraska Total Care, you can find a lot of this information on your own. I know in today's world, a lot of people are very good at Googling and, and going online and finding everything that they need. And so we work really hard to make our website interactive and, um, and be something that people can utilize and just serve them without having to, to contact anybody. So we do have a Find Your Provider, uh, we have a secure member portal, and we do have a mobile app. Um, we have Crane's Health Library that you can go on and look up different subjects that with health-related issues, and just 
see what the latest information is about those things um, on my strengths. And then we have an app Bertha, which is a community resources. So these are free or low cost, uh, various resources that are available to individuals. And you can just go on at any point in time and look something up. So it's very handy and very self-serving. Like Kim was talking, all of the MCOs, you know, have certain requirements by our contract, but we do have those added benefits that we can come up with, that we can um, have available for our individual members. So we have a healthy rewards program and where individuals do receive actual dollars on a, on a card that looks very much like a debit card. And it's the as you do the various kind of preventative testing or you know the well baby checks or uh, getting flu shots or various vaccines, um, actual dollars are added to those cards that the individuals can use at places like Walmart or CVS or dollar stores and, and purchase the things that they need. We do have a YMCA um, free membership, and that can be for children or adults. And you can go and work out or swim or do whatever kind of activities that you want with that. We have a Boys and Girls Club membership, so families can go there and you know learn life skills, have childcare provided, things like that, that, that they can just go and hang out during the summer. Uh, it's, it's very handy for families. We have a community garden as well, where we help people with the, you know, seeds or growing the food and, and the spaces. We help them fund the actual community garden space so that people can grow their own healthy food. And we do have a Weight Watcher program as well that uh, young adults or, or adults um, can have a free membership to that Weight Watcher program. So I kind of threw, flew through all of that. Um, we too have a member services line which people can call and find out who your care manager is or if you don't have one, you can call and get one. Um, we have a nurse advice line and there's our website actually. And then we also, for families or individuals who experience disability, you have me. Um, as I said, I am the Community and Disability Liaison. So I am that link between the disability community and our health plan. I am on the inside trying to help uh, all of our staff to have a better understanding of life with a disability and what families go through and what individuals go through in that experience. So if you have any questions or have any issues or um, just wanna know more about Nebraska Total Care, there's my contact information and my phone number. I would be happy to help you out. So I'll just give me a call or send me an email. So I think Jennifer and Fonda, I think that is it for me. I will stop sharing. And if anybody has any questions, just let me know. There aren't any questions currently in the chat box, but I will let you know if some come up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Joni. Um, so next we have Jennifer Wiesner from Healthy Blue. And I'll go ahead and unmute her. Maybe I should have pulled this up first. I'm a struggle bus tonight. I apologize. Where is my 
Here we go. All right. Like they said, my name is Jennifer Wiesner and I'm with WellCare of Nebraska. I'm excited to share with you guys that we will be rebranding to Healthy Blue um, as part of our partnership and collaboration with Blue Cross Blue Shield in Nebraska. So for our members, um, letters have started to go out. So if you or your children have WellCare, um, they may start receiving those letters in the mail. Um, and basically, it's just to let you know that all of the well care benefits that I shared tonight um, are still available to all of our members, and we will be providing more information. Um, the Healthy Blue Cards will start being sent out closer to open enrollment, and then the start January 1st, um, 2021 will be our official start date for um, Healthy Blue. Jennifer, I'm sorry, and I feel like we're a little bit remiss. Like, I don't think we've actually said when the open enrollment period. Is. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so that probably is good information for folks. Yeah, definitely. So for our Medicaid families, open enrollment will begin November 1st through December 15th. And that is your opportunity. Um, if you want to choose a different plan that you can do so. If you are happy with the plan that you're at, the state has it set up very nicely that you don't have to do anything at all. Um, but it is your opportunity to take a look at that comparison chart. Um, and I will reference that. It's on the Heritage Health of Nebraska website. The 2021 is posted. Um, I believe what I sent over to Jennifer was 2020. So I think it's very important that we make sure that our families understand the benefits that they still have to make sure that they take advantage of those um, for their children. But then also we wanna help educate you on those 2021 benefits. Um, and we'll really start educating more um, starting November 1st during that open enrollment period to help our members in the community understand more. Um, I apologize, I don't have um, a lot of our value adds for 2021 as we're transitioning um, to Healthy Blue. I have that presentation sitting in a work stream. And so I'm going to do my best to share the information that I have. Um, I also sent my contact information to Jennifer. Um, you can call me, email me directly if you have a question um, regarding a well care member, your child, um, yourself. So please reach out, don't hesitate. Um, my job is really to make sure that you're connected to any part of well care that you need. So I'm gonna start with our value added services. Um, as Kim and Joni both mentioned, um, all the plans follow the same state guidelines and um, regulations of what Medicaid, what we provide. Um, for that physical health, behavioral health, and pharmacy needs. And then what really sets us apart is those value-added services. Um, and I think that that's important for our families to know what they have available. So part of our value-add is our 24-hour behavioral health crisis line. We do post-ER follow-up with incentives. So our goal is really to help connect our members to those urgent cares, um, help them find a PCP if they need um, one or just help them find a new one. Um, behavioral health provider consultations. And then we also have no co-pays um, for that waiver for Medicaid cover services. We also offer a cell phone. And so for any of our members that have a high risk pregnancy or chronic conditions um, or are part of that foster care members, um, they can contact customer service and receive information on the eligibility for that in the process. Um, next is our college and trade school scholarships. So we do offer free GED testing. And then we also have um, two different bundles. So we offer scholarships to our well care members. Um, and if anyone is entering into college or currently in college, please reach out to me. Um, the other one is a bundle for our foster care kiddos. Um, anyone who's transitioning into college, we offer dorm room supplies or my first apartment supplies um, if they're entering into 
um, college or trade school. The next one is that hyperallergenic bedding, and that is going to be for any of our members in um, case management. And so they would need to have a asthma diagnosis, and then they receive their choice of a twin, full, king, or queen size bed cover, sheets, and pillowcases. And that's, again, just done through their care manager. We also offer personal care items. And so this is $10 worth of those items per household. And I did send that catalog to Jennifer. So if you are a well care member and you are not taking advantage of this benefit, and if you just have questions of how to get connected, I'll share a little bit further in my presentation, but please reach out to me. I wanna make sure that you guys are all connected. These are our value added rewards for our members. This is how we incentivize our members for completing those certain health activities. So we have our well child checks um, and the new one for 2020 was our lead check for our kiddos prior to their second birthday. Um, and then we also have our healthy pregnancy reward where our moms can earn a gift card for attending that first prenatal appointment during the first trimester of 42 days into enrollment, um, along with their choice of that bonus gift. And then also during their postpartum visit, they're able to um, get a gift card and new to 2020, I'm gonna start saying 2021 and that's like too soon yet. So. Um, is our diaper program. So that's gonna go along with that postpartum visit and then following baby into those appointments. We also offer chronic care management incentives, our well women checks and our adult health. Next is our member and community engagement team. So this is my team. Um, and the goal is really for us to connect to our members and help educate them on their benefits and make sure that um, they're able to receive any of those benefits or connect them back to care management. Um, if there's a problem with pharmacy or getting a prescription filled, we want to make sure that we are present in the community so that we can refer you guys back to the correct people the first time um, and make that a seamless process for you. A couple of ways that we help our members stay connected is through our WellCare mobile app. So you're able to find a provider, um, receive provider visit reminders, your ID card is on there. So if you forget it at home when you're at the office, you can pull it up on your phone, which is really nice. Um, and then you can also search for urgent care. So if something comes up, instead of going to that ER room, um, you can locate an urgent care that's covered. Once you sign up for the app, which you enter your password or your username and password, that will be the same for our secure member portal. Um, and through that secure member portal is where you can um, attest to any of those appointments for those value added benefits to receive your gift cards. So we have our new member information that will start to go out. Um, this will also include our new member packet. Um, and that's sent 10 days from the time that we get the information from the state. So once you're eligible and the state sends it, we get that out to you right away. So any questions, just let us know. Um, this next little part is just about um, our expansion population and our care and case management teams. So our member outreach, this is gonna be specific during our pandemic time. Um, we do have four welcome rooms across the state located in Kearney, Norfolk, Scotts Bluff, and Omaha. These are currently closed, but we are starting to open them. Um, and so members can come in and ask questions. So if you get a letter in the mail that you're unsure of, um, or would just like some face-to-face -face, um, time to ask any questions or walk through how to access those benefits, those are great resources to use. You can also contact our member service line. And then we also open up our rooms to any groups, um, support groups, 
any partners in the community that are needing a space to hold a group or meeting. So you would just reach out and let me know. One way that we help improve health through our community engagement is through attending health fairs, community meetings. We offer well care days where we're again, just connecting with our members to help provide that information to them. We have a member advisory committee. And if anyone on this call has well care or their child and you would like to participate in that, that is truly when we get um, feedback of how the plan's going, what's working, what's not. Um, I can say that back in 2017, um, we saw a need for car seats in the community and that was voiced during one of those calls. And so we were able to get that added to um, our value added benefits. So that's definitely one of our successes. Um, like the other two plans, we do community baby showers. Um, one of the other unique things to well care slash healthy blue are our community farmers markets. We also offer summer safety events, fall festivals, and crime plan education. And this is the contact information for our team. Um, Renee is no longer um, the community relations manager. She has taken a director position, but you can reach out to Julie, Kelsey, myself, or Mindy for any questions that you may have. That's all I have. We do have some questions here in the chat box um, right. for you, Jennifer. Um, will there be a new app for the for Healthy Blue in 2021? Yep, there sure will be. So once um, those new member packets start getting sent out, um, there will be tons of information in there and that will be included. Um, I did send an email link to you, Jennifer, I believe just recently in that chat box. We do have a um, choose healthy blue backslash Nebraska, I want to say, but she'll send it out. Um, and that would be our current website. So you could keep an eye on that for updates as well. Okay, I did send out um, that information that you had chatted to me out to the group. So you, you all should have seen it. If not, let me know. Um, another question, um, will those welcome rooms still be available once the transition to Healthy Blue? Yep, we're excited. Um, we are in the process of opening one in Lincoln as well but they all four will continue to operate. Right, um, now we had a specific question as to the YMCA membership um, through Total Care for a minor. Um, do you need me to unmute you? Is it working? I think you're muted. So what, yes, can you hear me? Yep. So what was the question? Um, they were looking, a minor go? Um, yes, on getting a membership for a minor. Is it a family membership or how do they um, get that benefit? It, everyone who has Nebraska Total Care as their insurance and as their coverage can get that the YMCA membership. So if, you know, everyone is on the plan, they can, each individual one, I'm so sorry. They were being so good. Um, but as, so yes, anybody, you know, in the family that is on our plan can get that, that card, that membership. Okay, and then kind of a general overarching question for all of you. Do you all have um, member advisory committees to all three of the plans? Yes? Okay. I don't know. Yes. 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 Yeah. How would somebody go get connected with that or how would they find out more about that? Um, well, for they hours. Can... Go ahead. 
sorry, for Nebraska Total Care, um, they could contact me and I can connect them. And we are looking for members to be a part of that. So that would definitely, I, I can connect them. Jennifer, they can reach out to me, Kim Manning for United Healthcare. Okay. Jennifer, would you mind just kind of explaining a little bit about what that is? Yeah, so the Member Advisory Committee, that is truly our opportunity as a plan, which I won't speak for all three, but I imagine it's pretty similar. Um, we bring together for well care, we typically provide some education, um, whether it's on specific value added benefits or um, something in the community. And then we're also looking for feedback for our families. So things that are going well, things that aren't working, um, you know, maybe there's a service not covered that, you know, it's their time to advocate, honestly, either for themselves or their um, family member. Okay. For United we Healthcare, we do meet um, quarterly. Um, the advisory group meets. Um, we do provide education as well. And then um, it's truly advisory groups. So they help us in terms of um, improvements, ways in which we can make the member experience better, have a better understanding in terms of unique needs that members have. Um, and then they actually give us feedback so we can make adjustments um, where it's appropriate. Quarterly is the same for well care. I think Joni's muted again. I, I was. <laughs> and yes, that's why I was muted. Um, so yeah, we, ours is quarterly as well. Uh, we do provide transportation to that if the individual needs that. And, um, and we have a little lunch, so. But it is like, like Jennifer and Kim said, ours is the same. Uh, we want to know what's working and what isn't and, and what, what we can do about making it a better experience for everyone. Are the other, I know Joni, you said you guys, um, you are actively looking for um, participants for mm -hmm. that. Are the, are the other um, MCOs also looking for more participation? Because it sounds like a really great way for families to kind of come forward and bring their voice and be heard and to share kind of like their lived experience and what would be helpful for them. Yes, very much so, Rhonda. Okay, we've got a few more questions here. Um, this is a question for all three of the MCOs. I refer many families to care management and sometimes it's difficult to refer over the phone. Is there something that we can do to improve the way um, referrals are accepted for care management or social, social services, like adding an option to the web page. I think that's a, a great thing to bring up with the member advisory board. <laughs> if you want to <laughs> so for well care, I would love to take that back to my care management team and give them that feedback. Um, I think that you could reach out to me directly. Um, or I can provide you that manager because I know she's she accepts emails as well. Um, calling into customer service is just an additional option. So I can provide that information. Yeah, I, I would agree. Okay. If you just if you want me to unmute you, Joni, just let me know and I can Okay, yeah. I keep uh, I keep putting it on so that you're not disturbed. But same, I'm just over here nodding. Yes, because we we can do the same. I mean, I think it's a good idea. And I don't know if if somehow in our secure portal if we can do that. Um, but that that's a great question, and I'll find out. Okay. Um, another general question: Can someone change their MCO? Um, outside of open enrollment period? 
you, as I understand it, you can um, if you know they want to know what the reason is. Um, but a person can do that. So a member has, when they initially join, they have 90 days that they can make a switch. And then it's in the annual cycle, November 1st to December 15th. But there is for cause reason. So if there's been a change where a PCP has left a MCO and it's important that that family has that continuity, then um, cases brought forward to the state and those appropriate changes can take place as well. And I believe that paperwork can be found on the Heritage Health of Nebraska website. Yes. All right. Um, so just a little bit about the, the, more specifically the care coordination or case management. Um, I know you kind of went in, in your presentations into the services. Um, but who is that provided to? Is it the whole family or just the, the member on um, with that insurance? Barb, do you want to take that question for United Healthcare? I absolutely. Uh, thank you, Kim. Can everyone hear me? I I think I'm yes. unmuted now. Thank you. Um, our, when our clinical coordinators reach out uh, to the families or to the member, we're looking at um, the subscriber ID and we're looking to see if there are other family members in that household too. Um, because usually if there's a social determinant of health um, care need in that family, it's not just affecting one member of the family, it's affecting the whole family. And if you have a child who has a severe medical condition, it's gonna affect siblings, it's gonna affect parents, or vice versa, you have a parent um, who's going through a cancer treatment, whatnot. So we're looking out to see the whole family and wanting to engage with everyone in the household. Um, certainly uh, members who, um, you know, they, you know, you're, uh, to receive the benefits of the health plan, um, you have to be a member of the health plan. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna visit with that family. And if we find out for some reason that maybe mom or dad um, was assigned to um, say one of the other two MCOs, what we're gonna do is we're gonna reach out to that MCO and their clinical coordinator and share that information because we truly want the total family um, and the ones that need help and assistance that we're, that we're helping them. And if that means that we're gonna collaborate with our partner MCO, we're gonna do that. Or does that mean that we're gonna partner with our, um, um, the um, dental um, MCO, which is um, a, a, another um, entity. We're, our clinical coordinators are going to make those efforts and they're going to make those connections. So again, we may start out calling to talk to someone about uh, maybe a, a need that was just specific to that member, but as we continue that conversation with that person, we're going to explore to see if anyone else needs assistance and we're also going to reach out and try to make those things happen. Well, here I would echo what Barb said. That was perfect. We're definitely gonna, it typically will start with the member, I would say, but we're gonna assess everyone in the household to make sure that needs are being met because that's gonna directly affect that member. Right, and the same for our team. Okay, um, here is another question. Um, it's kind of more general with um, therapies. Um, there's been, it seems like with families, there's been a change in um, coverage and they're seeing more denials. Has there been a change in policy um, at your guys' um, organization that might have facilitated that? Barb, could I lean on you for that? Absolutely. Um, thank you for that question. So at United um, Healthcare, 
um, in the fall of last year of 2019, we did have some changes to our um, authorization process. And we worked collaboratively with the providers and uh, met with member groups. And after we had implemented our um, prior auth process for those therapies, um, after those discussions with, again, providers and, and members and different organizations across the state, we uh, identified additional ways that we could make that process easier and more uh, fluid um, for the member. And so we have made those changes. And so you should see the prior authorization process for the physical therapy, the occupational therapy, or the speech therapy, an easier process at United than what you may have experienced um, about a year ago. And so we, we um, like I said, we implemented something, but then we asked for feedback and um, worked with, um, again, families such as, uh, that may be on this call and providers who may be on this call and took to heart the information that was provided back to go back and make the experience more robust and user-friendly. So um, if anyone has additional needs or questions related to those therapies and the authorization process at United, please feel free to call me directly um, I'll be more than happy to uh, visit with you, uh, you know, and if there's something particular you want me to, to look into, I would be more than happy to. Um, but United, um, we did make a change, but then after we made the change, we went back and we enhanced it to make it better for our members. Okay. Uh, Jennifer or Joni, did you have anything to add or should I go to the next one? Go ahead, I didn't. I apologize, I muted myself. Um, to be very honest, this is not my expertise at all. Um, I would be happy to take that question back to our PR team and quality team um, and get an answer back to you guys. I would say if there's you know specific things that are continuing to be denied for maybe a certain member versus overall, definitely reach out. And I think even involving care management at that point to help kind of be that liaison is also really helpful. So kind of speaking to that, we did have a question. Um, who are the care managers or the, the care coordinators? Um, I know um, one of them was social workers. Um, mm -hmm. Are they all social workers across all three of the organizations or do they vary? Hi, this is Barb at United and I'll take that one. So at United, we have registered nurses, we have licensed independent mental health practitioners and we have master's level social workers. We do have uh, some community health workers who are individuals who have a um, college degree, um, but they're not in a licensed um, area. Um, so, but they have the experiences and the uh, backgrounds. They might be more public health. We have a few of those in our, in our um, team. And so um, our, I'm a registered nurse and Patricia is a licensed independent mental health practitioner. Um, and so we do the integrated care all the way up um, our chain in um, United Healthcare. And so these are individuals that you, your clinical coordinator um, is going to be located across the state. And um, we hire individuals who have um, deep knowledge and skill sets related to um, a wide variety of, um, of needs. So for example, we have um, nurses who are very um, adept and very skilled in the private duty nursing and pediatrics. Um, we have nurses who are uh, experts in transplant. We have behavioral health um, individuals, um, licensed behavioral health on the team that are experts in uh, psychiatric residential treatment center or um, the different therapies that um, an in individual might need. So um, we are, the United Health Plan is very heavy with um, licensed individuals 
um, to meet the needs of the members of Nebraska. So for well care, we have a three tier system. So we have our low, medium and high risk um, members. And so if our members fall in that high risk, whether it's a chronic health condition, um, you know, a severe behavioral health, if they are needing help with medication management and they are, they're wanting that um, more intense, I would say, care management, um, that would be our field team that's deployed statewide. They are all licensed um, professionals. So again, those nurses, behavioral health, and social workers. And I know that our um, manager of care management does a really nice job um, of connecting the most appropriate care manager to the case. Um, but also they work as a team to collaborate um, to make sure that all of our members' needs are met. So if they fall in that medium or um, low risk tier group, then that would be handled telephonically. Um, and it's really, they work with our members to develop the plan um, that works for them. So as far as how often they wanna communicate what those goals look like and how they can help achieve them. So that is what I have for well care. Well, and for Nebraska Total Care, I mean, I think structurally we're all kind of the same. We do have RNs that work with, like Jennifer said, the, uh, the more involved medically uh, members. And so they will set up the care plans with the individual. They'll set up the, the goals of what they're, you know, trying to resolve or what the health, the health level that they're working toward. Then we have program specialists, and those are the individuals that have more of a social work background and they're licensed social workers. So um, those individuals will help those members that don't necessarily aren't as clinically involved, but they might need help finding housing or DME, or um, they might need home health assistance or getting set up with transportation. And so they work on the more social determinant side. And then we have also the community health individuals. Uh, there are workers who, uh, some of them, you know, have some degrees, but they have experience in those community kind of issues and resources. And those are the ones that will go out and meet face to face. We all, all of our teams can go out and meet with individuals if, if that's required and if that's something that will help our member to get better services and to understand what's happening in their plan. So, um, yeah, we have physical therapists who review all of like the DME requests and we have uh, nurses who work with the hospitals on inpatient uh, situations and then and we all work together on that team to uh, deliver the best services to that that individual member okay more questions um so in the chat box um we selected our um mco and then found out after open enrollment um that a medication would not be covered, that it would have to be changed to generic. Um, is there any kind of communication or do you guys have any um, thoughts or advice on what um, individuals can do in this situation? If they chose their MCO, it's in place, and then they found out that a medication that they need um, would not be covered anymore. Um, what, what kind of route do you start with on that? I think you're all on mute. Uh, um, Whoever wants to take it, <laughs> right? Well, I was just going to say, um, I think that we look at those on an individual kind of basis. So, you know, for some people, they are unable to take that generic. So that might be what we currently have in our regulation or the way that we do business. But our chief medical officer is always willing to 
look at a situation and realizes that no two people are the same. So, you know, there have been situations where that may be the case and we've been able to get together and meet about it and talk about it and um, find the reasons for why that, why that generic brand won't work for that individual. So, you know, it, it's always something worth talking about to your health plan. So that's what I would say. Jennifer, Kim, did you want to take a stab so at I it? Don't, yeah, I, so I don't want to misspeak, but I want to say that there is a preferred drug list. And I want to say it's either on our website or Heritage Health. And I apologize, I can get back that definitive answer unless Kim or Joni know. Um, but that would give you clarity if it's a plan specific um, issue or if it's across the board that that's what we can cover. But I would echo what Joni said. There have been single case agreements for um, different medical needs. And so involving care or case management, I think is a really good route to go if you're struggling with something like that, um, to have a liaison within the plan to you know help work through that between your provider and the health plan. Yes, um, Jennifer is correct in terms of there is a preferred drug list that each of the health plans manage by, but I like to turn to Barb because this is some of the work that her team does day in and day out. If you would unmute her, Jennifer, then um, I think she could add some information for the families concerned about that. Mike. Hey. Bar? Yes, I am. I'm unmuted now. Thank you. Um, so this is a, um, an area that, you know, if you if you find out that your um, child is on a you know specific drug or needs a specific drug and um, you've gone through the authorization pro authorization process and the medication is denied, um, there all three health plans have the appeal process for the member um, to go through and you have a peer-to-peer -peer process in that appeal um, format that allows the physician-to-physician -physician discussion. Um, so the um, if your provider um, ha has requested an authorization and the medication is denied, um, then your provider can ask for a peer-to-peer -peer, and that's where that provi your provider is going to have that opportunity to have that discussion directly with the medical director who was overseeing that authorization and, and the, uh, potentially at that time, if your provider um, can add additional clarity or information, we call it clinical information, um, to that request. Um, then there's, um, you know, it's all based upon meeting medical necessity, um, based upon um, the guidelines that we work with, with the, within the state. Um, and so, you know, th there's that opportunity there for that um, provider to talk directly to um, the physician who was overseeing the case and provide additional clinical information to have that overturned. The other thing is like, if you um, have a denial, um, again, your clinical coordinator um, is your advocate for you within the system. And every uh, individual at United Healthcare is automatically assigned to a clinical coordinator. Um, and remember your clinical coordinators are your registered nurses and your licensed independent mental health practitioners who are working side by side. And so if you don't know who your clinical coordinator is, just pick up your phone, turn your card over and call member services. And again, they'll connect you with um, a clinical coordinator. We assign every member um, to a care management team person. That doesn't necessarily mean that you will ever use that person, but that person has already been identified and assigned to your case to help you. So if you're calling member services and say, I really need to speak to a clinical coordinator, they're going to either warm transfer you if um, the person is available, otherwise they'll send it over to um, one of the supervisors 
managers or even myself, um, I take those phone calls and we can start working on to try to figure out um, the medication that you or your family member needs and how can we best um, meet that need. Um, based upon uh, the condition, there, you know, there are guidelines within the medical communities that are called um, best practices or evidence-based medicine. Um, and so um, the state um, controls the preferred drug list and um, they will say that, you know, you should, it's recommended that you should start with this type of a medication for this particular situation. But we all know that not everyone is gonna respond the same to a medication. And that's why they have additional uh, information in there that says, you know, if they don't, you know, if the member can't um, take this medication, then, you know, try these other medications. And they'll work directly with your personal um, primary care physician or your behavioral health therapist or your psychiatrist for, or your specialist, maybe it's an endocrinologist that's uh, decided that you need a particular medication and work with them to find a medication that is going to work. Now there's always, if something is denied, the member, this is a process that's universal to all three MCOs. You, as a member, you have the right to go to a state fair hearing. A state fair hearing will put you in front of a judicial judge from the state, um, from the Medicaid uh, side. They're not employed by any of the MCOs. And that's your opportunity to share um, the information on the case with a, a total uh, separate party who's not associated with any of the MCOs to hear that particular case to see if it can be overturned. So there are many avenues in the process. So if you find out that you have something that was denied, don't feel that you just have to sit back and, that's, and it's okay if you feel strongly about it pick up the phone, call member services, ask for the clinical coordinator, and let's start helping you navigate the system because it could be as very simple as just turning in additional clinical information from your doctor um, to meet that medical necessity. And that would be my advice for um, any, any parent who, or member who is feeling that something was denied or they're not receiving something that they wanted, you know, we're, we're here to advocate for you and to help you. So pick up the phone and call us. We want to hear from you. Okay, we have um, just kind of a general question over the appeals process. And I know Barb, you kind of went into that. Um, but would you, Jennifer and Joni, like to just kind of give a brief overview of um, what you might appeal, what and um, kind of what that process looks like for individuals? Um, this is Barb, and I can you know jump in at any time to talk about appeals process um, if needed. I would say for well care, I am definitely not the expert. Um, I can get you well care specific, but I think that it's the same across the board. So if, if Barb has that answer, I would look for her for that direction and I appreciate it. Well, and I, I know briefly very, that's not my area of expertise either, but um, I do know that, you know, members can ask their care managers, but I will let Barb do the generic version. <laughs> well, thank you. And, and I, I, I too can get specifics if people want them. Um, I would just add really quick that if you, you know, whatever your plan is, if you reach out, someone will walk you through it. And that way you have someone, you know, guiding you each step of the way. But I think I didn't mean to interrupt again, Barb, so I apologize, but definitely reach out to your plan. And that's no problem at all. all. The appeal process is universal to all three MCOs and it's mandated by federal guidelines. And so um, if, if you have an, a service that requires an authorization, prior approval to receive the service, um, you will, um, your provider, 
he's going to write a prescription based upon your medical necessity, your needs, and that's going to go over to the prior authorization team, um, whatever each one of the MCOs calls that particular team, and they're going to build an authorization based upon that request from that physician. And then what's going to happen is that there is going to be um, a medical director who is going to review that request. And based upon um, the re whatever the service is that you're asking for, someone who has a, a, a specialty um, related to that service. So uh, pediatrics is going to be reviewing pediatric cases, um, et cetera. And so then that physician or that team, we have by the federal guidelines, we have 14, day, 40, 14 days to turn that request around. And we have 70, 72 hours um, to turn an expedited request around. And so um, your physician is going to put information into your case based upon your clinical, his or hers evaluation of your case. And that's called the clinicals that would need to meet medical necessity. And the Nebraska Administrative Code um, dictates, um, it gives us guidelines um, and there's also, um, um, uh, each MCO has their own policies, whatnot, um, but you can't be more restrictive than the Nebraska Administrative Code. And so these process, these information go to the physician, he reviews the case and say, maybe there's something, there's for say whatever reason, maybe um, there's a piece of documentation that your provider wasn't able to turn in. And so what happens then is um, we're gonna ask for clinical information, additional clinical information, and the provider hopefully will send it in. If for some reason they don't send it in, then based upon what information that that doctor sees at that moment in that case, he may or he or she may deny your request for that service. And then that's the then what happens then is that we send out a letter, you get a denial letter, but you can your provider can ask for um, um, he can ask for um, um, the peer-to-peer -peer. and the peer-to-peer -peer, um, is where the physician to physician will look at the case and talk about the case. And hopefully there's gonna be additional clinicals that are gonna be sent in and it gets overturned and approved. Um, there, you can ask for extensions. There's 14 day extensions in there. Say your physician is having difficulty gathering all that information um, or there's something else that needs to happen. Um, so you can ask for extensions, but usually a regular authorization is 14 days, expedited is 72 hours. And then um, what will happen is we do the peer-to-peer -peer and say the peer-to-peer -peer doesn't change anything um, and the service is totally denied. Then you as the consumer, you have the right to ask for a state fair hearing. And in your member handbook, it will state how you go about asking for a state fair hearing. And um, so if you call member services, they should be able to walk you through the process. If you have a clinical coordinator, they should be able, or a uh, um, navigator or, or whatever each MCO calls that person that's associated with your case, they're gonna be able to walk you through that process and help you. And our goal is we want you to have the services that you need that meet medical necessity. Nobody wants someone not to have something that truly meets medical necessity. So it's all about getting the paperwork together that shows that physician who's reviewing your case exactly what do you need at that moment that um, that, that service that you're requesting will uh, benefit you. And so you have to meet that medical ne necessity criteria and that's all in the documentation. And then um, you start going through the appeal process. Um, so you can't, and even if you go to a state fair hearing and you don't like what happened at the state fair hearing, you can even take it outside and then go into a district court. So there's a lot of avenues. Um, you, have, you have choices, you have rights, and your MCO is there to help you with that. And um, so, you know, we want to, you know, we want to help you. I mean, um, you know, we're going to the state fair hearing too. You know, it's, it's, you know, nobody wants to go to that area. So everybody wants to be customer friendly and help um, you along the way to make sure that, you know, if there's a service that you need that, you know, we're getting all that documentation together and getting it in front of the right person within that timeline so it doesn't get denied. 
And that's pretty much a, a, a appeal process in a nutshell. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question um, around um, cultural competency or cultural sensitivity in your organizations, um, particularly um, with case management and Spanish speaking families. Do you guys have translators available or um, what, what services or supports do you provide for Spanish speaking families? So for um, United Healthcare, um, one of the things that we do on a monthly basis is we bring in community resources that serve various population in cultures to provide information on what they offer. So like the Latino Center or the South Omaha Community Advisory Group. And these are organizations that provide information to us as a health plan in terms of ways in which we can refer back to appropriate services for those members. We do utilize our language line, um, which offers um, language in um, um, various languages, Spanish, Arabic, Karen, Burmese. And then um, if you can unmute um, Patricia Cartledge, she'll talk about some of the training that the clinical team goes through to be culturally competent. Patricia? Hey, Kim, thank you. Uh, thanks everyone. Uh, so the one of the neat things I think about um, case management is always about meeting the member exactly where they are. And one of the things that we're very sensitive to is that you can't, um, you can use the language line and, and I'm so glad we have that for, especially for unique dialects, but especially within our plan, you know, we've made a concerted effort that we have clinical staff that are hired that are bilingual in Spanish, Arabic. Um, we do uh, cultural competency training regularly. Um, we also have lunch and learns where we bring in um, additional um, on-site training to make sure that the team is, is, um, is aware and in touch with uh, the unique needs of our members. Um, and then in addition to that, you know, we, um, it probably, it might sound a little bit, um, maybe strict is the wrong word, but we wanna make sure not only that they understand it and that they embrace it, but we hold them accountable to it. So we will go through and we, we test our staff on their knowledge of, of cultural competency and what that means for the members. And I can, I can tell you that even utilizing the language line, having staff on staff who are bilingual outreaching, especially our Spanish speaking population, it means a great deal to them to have someone right there um, who can call and engage, not necessarily needing to utilize an interpreter. We have found great success and we have pivoted those staff um, strategically within each one of our populations. So our maternity program has, you know, bilingual and Spanish staff and bilingual in Arabic, because we really wanna help those expectant moms, you know, um, have healthy babies. And then um, same thing for our um, older adults, we have a bilingual staff that uh, works in that category. And then, you know, it's not just cultural competencies, competency is not just about language. And I, you know, I can't recall, I apologize, Barb, if you or Kim brought it up, but, you know, we utilize our tribal liaison, right, um, to make sure we're, um, we're sensitive to um, the, the native populations. We also want to be sensitive to you know, our homeless members. So we have the housing navigator, navigator which I know Kim um, spoke to, but there's, we work with our refugee population. Um, so I, I think that there is lots of opportunity when you're looking at case management. Um, you know, I, one example would be, you know, making sure that, um, that we're aware and sensitive to, um, respecting the uh, traditions, the uh, infrastructure of each uh, different uh, population as they um, come into case management. Building rapport is gonna be different for some. Um, you know, uh, eye contact, of course, is one of the first things that come to mind, uh, how you might uh, respond to uh, a Middle Eastern family compared to, um, you know, the, uh, just a, a 
Hispanic family, the, 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 the cultural norms are pretty critical. So um, for our team, there's lots of ongoing training, testing, uh, review, uh, engagement with our com community agencies to keep that uh, skill sharp. And then also making sure that we hire the right people to meet that member right where they are. Okay, thank you. We echo this for well care as well. We have ongoing training and education, um, and we do offer throughout um, our staff um, the ability to really coordinate what's the best fit for our members. Um, we do utilize an internal um, translation line, and we also offer in person translation. Um, I know that there have been some hiccups, so it's a process that we continue to work on to, to better ourselves and um, make sure that we're meeting our members' needs and we're meeting our members where they're at. Um, I know for my team specific, we have two bilingual staff members. So um, instead of maybe me continuing to work with that member and utilizing a language line, I'm going to do a warm handoff to someone that can speak um, in their cultural language. And so it's just that rapport is, is built. I don't know if I want to say faster, or easier, but it does, it makes a huge difference. And, and we're very aware of that. So we continue to strive to, to continue to educate our staff. And I guess I would say the same. I mean, we have the language line as well. We have some bilingual staff. Um, we do have the tribal liaisons um, who, I know at least one of our tribal liaison was native and, or is native. And so, um, you know, certainly understands the, the way of that culture. So uh, we, we do the same. Okay, another hot topic, transportation. Can you guys give us just a little rundown of how transportation, um, that benefit um, works for your organization um, for a member to get to a health appointment or to some kind of provider or just transportation in general? So for United Healthcare, um, the transportation vendor is Logisticare. We made a transition to logistic care October 1st. Um, we follow the state's guidelines for transportation. Um, you know, it's for non-emergent medical transportation. Um, there is within um, three days to make an appointment. You um, can utilize an app tool to schedule your appointment. You can schedule out regular appointments. So if you have a you know, two-week appointment with a provider, you can schedule those out with the transportation vendor. Uh, if there is any um, member question or um, some assistance that needs to be made, the um, individuals on this call can reach out to me and I'll put you in touch with our transportation manager. And our transportation provider is MTM. And we have a, a mobile app where people can, if they have a smartphone, they can, or computer go on and um, schedule their own rides. We too have, you know, if you have a dialysis appointment three days a week, it's always at the same time. You can schedule that out so you don't have to worry about it every day. Um, and we have a, a person that, oversees that within our office as well. For WellCare, we are the only one that stayed with IntelliRide, um, who was previously contracted directly with the state. So it's the same process. Um, the 72 hours notice is still highly suggested. Um, and that's for non-medical emergency transportation. And then we also offer through our value added benefits, 
um, transportation to WIC appointments and childbirth classes as well. Is there um, some rules around that, that just the member and an adult, what about siblings? Um, are there any kind of restrictions on who can utilize the transportation going to the appointment that you guys know of? So if a mother needs to go to an appointment and she has her children, um, they can um, go in the car, but they have to provide the car seats. Um, so there is a um, process with that. Um, and then, you know, there's unique family circumstances. So any special family circumstance, just work with the transportation manager and we'll make things work for a member. So for well care in, under Intelleride, I'll have to get back to you guys. Previously, I know with the state, it was very, very specific um, to if the child had the appointment, one adult could go. Um, if it was an adult that had the appointment, they did not want minors being transported. And I know that it was a liability issue, um, but I know that we have been working with them to help educate and just see um, if we can expand on that. So let me double check if, if we have updates for currently or 2021. Okay. And I'm gonna have to go along with Jennifer. I know that there have been some issues where, you know, with how many kids could go and, and if the mom had a, a, a doctor's appointment but had an infant and the infant couldn't go if they didn't have an appointment. And so I know there were some complications. I don't know if those have been changed. So I will have to get back to you. Okay. Um, another question um, about lodging. If a family has um, an overnight stay um, out of town, um, does the organization, the MCO, pay for help pay for the lodging? I know that we kind of tackle those one situation at a time. I mean, that that's an individual kind of, uh, I, don't, I don't have a generic answer, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Uh, so it, it is a person by person situation, or we will try to help if and locate other resources that might be available because there are some programs that people are eligible for that um, that might help with that if, if for some reason we can't, but it's done on a case by case. Okay. So my understanding for well care is it would be very similar. Um, if someone was in need of lodging and there was overnight stay involved, we'd probably want to get a care manager involved and they would be able to help um, locate services within the community that might be able to help provide for that family. Um, but as far as plan specific, I am not aware of it, but I can definitely, I wrote that one down also so I can send that back to you. Uh, thank you. This is um, Barb for United. And so the Nebraska Administrative Code is your guideline here. Um, they have um, in that um, the NAC manual is, is referred to. There are provisions for um, the MCOs must co cover um, the travel piece of it. And so depending on, first of all, they look at for travel to see if there's a working car in the home. Um, and um, so, and then depending on how far away the appointment is traveling the distance one way, um, and I'm not going to be able to exactly quote that one. I think it's greater than 200 miles round trip, um, but um, they, there is a provision there that um, we will provide transportation to the appointment. Um, and then for lodging, if you have to stay overnight in the Nebraska Administrative Code is specific on the provisions there as far as if you have like an early morning appointment um, and, um, and you can't, it's, um, you've got, you know, over 100 miles, you're going one way that, you know, to bring the person in the night before, um, 
house them in a hotel and then um, go into, you know, to the appointment the next morning and then provide the transportation back home. Um, so the clinical coordinator um, can help the member navigate this, um, also the transportation manager, but your clinical coordinator is uh, your best route to, they know the policies, they can help you with that. Um, if you have to go out of state for um, a treatment, um, there's, there's a gap of, in providers in the state of Nebraska, um, that clinical coordinator can help arrange those uh, transportation and um, work with the facility that you're going to, to help with the, um, the housing. Um, some areas, you know, they'll have like a Ronald McDonald house and, um, you know, the, it's preferred that the a member and family stay at the Ronald McDonald house while the maybe it's a child who's going through some sort of a transplant or chemotherapy or whatnot. So um, we all know that members care is very complex and the needs are very specific. And so um, the Nebraska Administrative Code does give you the guidelines to start with. Then the next place that you're gonna go to is the, the transportation guidelines are, are um, those again are um, mandated by the, um, I don't know, it's not the feds, it's the um, uh, Department of Transportation as far as like um, the rules as to how many people can go um, to an appointment, um, what's covered or not. And your clinical coordinators are going to know that information. They're going to be able to help you navigate that process. Um, you know, we've had individuals who um, have had to go to, say, um, Minnesota for a particular um, type of a service and and you know there's 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 flight availability in your transportation benefit um, so if you need to have a plane ticket to to get to the place of the of the service there's there's that benefit um, once you land there's they're not going to um, pick up a car or anything like that but they've gotten you to the you know to the city and then usually the the hotel or the um, Ronald McDonald House will have transportation to help the parent get back to the the, the lawn where they're going to stay. Um, there's a food benefit um, in the um, policy. Um, it's it's in, again these are um, you know the we go back to the Nebraska Administrative Code to give us some guidance um, as an MCO, and those are regulations that have been written by the state of Nebraska, and, you know, they'll say, like, there's uh, a $25 food limit per day uh, for the child and then the, 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 mem the adult that's accompanying them, and um, they're really pretty specific, uh, you know, it's not, I've had where individuals have thought, well, I will go to the grocery store and I'll buy $100 worth of groceries and that because I'm staying at one of the efficiency apartments and that will, uh, you know, I, you know, that will be savings for everyone for the state or and for my family we will get it all at once. Well, the guidelines say $25 per day. So you bought something that was $100 on one day that they're not going to pay. We're not going to reimburse back for the full hundred dollars because it was it says twenty five dollars per day so things are pretty specific when you start to travel with your benefits but your clinical coordinators and your member services teams are going to know those ins and outs and they're going to be able to help you with that information and the same thing with the transportation piece the transportation company is going to know what the benefits are for the transportation so best bet is get yourself a clinical coordinator or a, a whatever each health plan calls their clinical staff to help walk you through that and help guide you with that. And you're probably gonna want some uh, care management help along the way too, because if you're traveling for a test, that means you've got something going on or you need a procedure, and especially if you're having to travel quite some distance, you got a lot of things to navigate and that's what the clinical coordinators are there to do is to help you with those types of items. Okay, thank you. That that was it for the questions. Um, I'll throw it back to Rhonda. Unless anybody has anything else to add before we close. Okay, great. Well, I just want to take a, you know a moment to thank everyone, um, Kim, Joni, Jennifer, 
and um, Barb. Um, and I'm sorry, I forgot the other um, uh, from the United. I forgot her name. I apologize. Um, but Patricia. thank you all. For, <laughs> Patricia. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, for coming and sharing this information. I think this was really helpful um, and kind of giving us an overview of the different um, options that families have and, and kind of assessing that. Um, also, thank you to our participants for um, taking the time this evening, still living in this crazy world that we're in right now. Um, we will be having future sessions. And like I said, um, this session, if you want to go back and catch something um, that someone said or um, contact information, this is going to be posted. It's probably going to take a couple of days for editing, um, but then we will have it available in that video library on MMI's website as well. So you can go back and check that out or if you know someone else that might benefit from having a chance to hear this information. Um, so again, thank you. Thank you, everyone.